This is World War II, Lesson 1, The World Between the Wars. So what you're looking at there is the cover of Newsweek magazine from October, of, October 9th, 1939. And uh, this handshake represents a pact between the Soviet Union, led by Joseph Stalin on the left, and Germany, Nazi Germany, um, with its representative at this meeting, von Ribbentrop, um, basically shaking hands on a deal that will be called the Soviet Nazi Non-Aggression Pact. Probably something you haven't heard of before, so we'll get into that as we get there. So... Last we were talking about the Soviet Union, we had talked about the idea that um, Vladimir Lenin had this uh, Russian revolution and uh, the Ru Russia has changed into the Soviet Union and it was a communist state. You can see uh, on the right is uh, Vladimir Lenin, the guy who started the Soviet Union and the communist state. Um, on the left, is the guy who will eventually be his successor. His name is Joseph Stalin. Um, Stalin wasn't his real last name. He has a big, long last name that I can't pronounce, uh, but he changed it to Stalin, which means man of steel. So he's one of those guys that like to give themselves their own nicknames, which is kind of weird, but whatever. Anyway, Joseph Stalin was kind of a, an enforcer or a tough guy in the Communist Party for Vladimir Lenin. Uh, and Lenin figured out quick that Joseph Stalin's kind of crazy. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, the last thing he wanted was Joseph Stalin to take over when he died. And he did die. I can prove it because, well, I see dead people. That's actually the body of Vladimir Lenin uh, embalmed and preserved in, so in what is you know today Russia. Um, and people still visit his grave and uh, can still see him. Uh, I know it's been it's been a rough go. They've had to to shut it down and and fix them up a little bit because apparently the human body is not meant to be on display like this for for that long. Uh, but that's Vladimir Lenin. But when he wrote his, will, oh, you're still looking at him, aren't you? It's it's a dead guy on your screen. Um, when he wrote his will, one of the things that he wrote was, "Please do not let Joseph Stalin take over. Uh, the guy's crazy. Don't let him be the guy." And 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 that's the one of the issues that the Soviet Union is going to have in terms of its leadership is the fact that it doesn't really have a, a procedure for who's next. Like if the leader dies, there's no like line of succession like we have here. Like if something happens to the president of the United States, the vice president moves up and, and there's an order of succession if things were to happen. In the Soviet Union, uh, they're not going to have that. Most communist states don't have a procedure. It becomes a, a power struggle. So when Lenin dies, Joseph Stalin... Uh, wins this crazy power struggle uh, and becomes the guy. Even though Lenin had hoped and it, that it wouldn't happen, it, it does. Joseph Stalin takes what was Lenin's dream of this communist state that would, would eventually benefit the workers, and he turned it into a police state. He turned it into a, a ruthless dictator, a tyrant who tolerated no failure or criticism. And you can see Joseph Stalin there. A little bit older. This is uh, around the time of World War II. So uh, I found this uh, series of, of posters promoting Joseph Stalin, giving him, you know, different roles, uh, showing him uh, in in kind of what is a Napoleonic type um, uh, pose, you know, with the hand inside the jacket, like Napoleon famously was pictured. Uh, here he is, you know, steering the ship. You know, he's gonna he's gonna lead us through the storm and and steer the ship to to good prosperous times and there he is of course the kids love joe stalin but uh this picture reminds me of, of uh, kind of a famous story about joe stalin that sounds crazy but i've heard it enough times and seen it at enough documentaries that it's hard not to believe that it's true um so joseph stalin used to um have certain there were certain unwritten rules regarding joseph stalin so if he came in to speak or he came to an event um, you gave him a standing ovation and you didn't stop 
the standing ovation until he kind of gave you the signal that it's time to stop the standing ovation and he's ready to move forward with whatever event this was or if he's going to speak or whatever. So he gets announced in this uh, in this auditorium. It's a huge auditorium full of people, full of supporters. And uh, he, he gets announced and the crowd stands up and they're they're applauding for Joe Stalin. You know, they love him. They're like, hey, hey, Uncle Joe Stalin. There he goes. You know, they love they love Joe Stalin. And uh, Man of Steel, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. So they're they're standing and they're clapping and they're clapping and they're clapping and, and they're waiting for that signal, like time to, you know, time to stop clapping, let's sit down, let's get move forward with this. And apparently that day he decided he was gonna make a point. Well, after an hour. People were like getting tired. <laughs> this this was getting ridiculous, and there. But they they you don't want to be that first guy who sits down because when you sit down, if you've been in you know an audience where there's a standing ovation, I bet, and if you sit down, other people around you start to sit down too, and and so then eventually everybody sits down. Well, after two hours, people are sore, they're tired, they're they're like almost ready to pass out. This is getting ridiculous, and Joe Stalin is just sitting up there soaking up the whole thing, loving every minute of it. Well, about three hours into this, and again, I, I wouldn't believe it either if I didn't hear it from enough, like, credible sources. Um, about three hours into it, somebody said, a guy, a guy, he sits down. And then eventually all the people around him start to sit down, and then eventually everybody, you know, everybody sits down, and they went on with whatever speech or whatever was happening. I hope it was short because they had just stood for three hours clapping. Uh, that night, the guy who sat down first was taken by Stalin's secret police and, and, and never was seen again. His family never saw him again. So he made his point that, that, that uh, day that uh, he can make your hands clap. Hashtag, you can make your hands clap. But he was in control. This aspect of Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union is going to be covered up for a long time. Um, he was a mass murderer. I mean, he didn't necessarily do it with his own hands. He had his people doing it for him. But uh, it won't be until the mid-1950s where we start to find out that Joe Stalin was really a bad guy. As a matter of fact, he was responsible for more death than Adolf Hitler. Um, and what made it even crazier was the people that he was murdering, for the most part, were, were his own people. Um, anybody who potentially uh, spoke out against him, uh, could be a potential political threat. Um, anybody who wasn't complying with the, the Soviet system as far as he saw it, he murdered millions of peasants, but kept his regime of terror covered up. He would send them to the gulags, these working prison camps. Um, it, it was just awful, but everybody was afraid to talk about it. So we, as the United States and, and the rest of the world, didn't find out about it for you know until the mid-1950s. We're just getting to the 1940s now. He was successful as a communist leader of the Soviet Union because he gave his people an enemy to hate. And the, and the enemy to hate was us, the United States, because we liked capitalism and democracy. And that's the opposite of communism and a dictatorship. So he gave the people someone to hate. It was us. Um, and in the end, as I said before, the Soviet Union was not really a worker's paradise that you know Lenin had, had promoted using you know Marxism. Um, it was more of a police state with a dictator who was ruthless and his people were terrified of him. And uh, there it is. So people went out of their way to promote how much they loved Joseph Stalin. Like pictures of him were everywhere. Um, one of the things about communism was, was that you, you had no religion under communism. And this was a very religious part of the world. Um, the Russians were very religious people. and. Uh, Catholicism was huge in in uh, in Russia, but because it was a communist state, they could have no pictures of of their God and of Jesus and whatever uh, gods they worshipped. They had to have pictures of Joe Stalin. Joe Stalin was who they had to worship. So there were pictures of him everywhere. People were naming their kids after him. Their streets were named after him. There were pictures of him everywhere up on buildings. It was this cult of Stalin. He was in complete control. You can see him there on the cover of Time magazine. And there he is also uh, on a book. If 
found this uh, in, in the library. Um, you see, it was from uh, Catholic Library Services from back in the 1930s. And it's, you know, a little political cartoon on the front showing you how communism works. Um, and uh, they want you to keep this pamphlet moving. You may recognize the song backing this. This is my nemesis from Phineas and Ferb. You got you got to love Phineas and Ferb. And, and who's crazier than Dr. Doofenshmirtz, am I right? All right, so let's get you into what is actually happening around the world here. It's not just Joseph Stalin that's kind of taken over and, and created a situation. Uh, over in Italy, we have uh, Uncle Benny, Benito Mussolini. Benito Mussolini founded the fascist party in 1919 and took over the leadership of Italy by 1922 from King Victor Emmanuel. Now, we didn't really get into what fascism is, but let me just, it's easy to explain. Um, fascism is, if you've ever heard the phrase, um, there's no I in team, you know, the idea that, that uh, um, you know, if everybody works hard and they're not selfish and everybody works for the benefit of the team, eventually the team will win. And then if the team wins, then you'll have individual success. That's the idea. Um, you know, you can't be a selfish player, you know, a basketball team, soccer team, whatever. Um, Mussolini's fascism was kind of along that, uh, those lines. He wanted you to sacrifice yourself for the better of Italy. And he wanted to make Italy, he wanted to make Italy great again. And he had um, a tool to use to his advantage. He had the ancient ruins of ancient Rome all over you know, Italy. He had reminders to the people of Italy how great an empire they had before. And he got them believing into the idea that they could be that great again. But you got to listen to everything I tell you. I'm going to be the dictator. I'm going to lead. I'm going to lead you there. And uh, don't go against me. And um, if you sacrifice yourself for the state of Italy, for the country of Italy, Italy will once again rise up and be great. And then the re then we as individuals will then benefit from that later. That's basically fascism. So it's it's sacrifice for the state. Um, the government controls pretty much everything, and, and you don't have a lot of rights either. There's Benito Mussolini. There he is a little bit older there, or during the World War II era. So we have Mussolini in Italy. We have Stalin over in the Soviet Union. And you might have heard of this guy, uh, this crazy guy, um, over in Germany. Uh, this guy took over in 1932, I believe, um, and uh, got control of the Reichstag, which is the uh, German parliament. And uh, the, he and his Nazi party, which is a political party, um, he rebuilt Germany and actually got Germany out of the Great Depression faster than any other nation. Now, to be fair, Joseph Stalin um, didn't have a problem with the Great Depression at all because uh, because since they have a communist system, everybody has the same, nobody has a lot. So Great Depression really didn't affect them so much. In Germany, and, and remember, the Great Depression was a worldwide problem, not just a United States problem. In Germany, uh, when Hitler took over, he he got Germany out of the Great Depression crazy fast. Now, the way he did it was awful. I mean, obviously, with the uh, the ghettos and uh, um, stuff you should have learned about. Well, if you uh, if we still had a world history class, you would have learned about it. But uh, he had these working camps that uh, Jews and others were being forced to work in, and. Uh, um, but we didn't know that, like the rest of the world didn't know what he was doing and how he was doing it. And uh, because he was so successful, he was time man of the year in the mid 1930s. That's crazy to think about the fact that he becomes time man of the year. Uh, and there he is with his little Nazi salute. I don't know why he has like short stubby hands and his fingers are weird. I, I, I don't know what he's what's going on there. I, I, maybe the picture is like compressed. It's a compressed image there. And there he is with uh, kind of a hero of his with Benito Mussolini from Italy. Um, Mussolini in Italy had a nickname. His nickname was Il Duce. Il Duce means the leader. So Hitler uh, in Germany 
gave himself a nickname. Remember, we talked about Stalin being a guy that gave himself a nickname. He made, called himself Man of Steel. Well, Hitler's one of those guys, too. He gave himself a nickname. Uh, and uh, he named himself after Mussolini. Uh, he called himself the leader, but in German, it was Der Führer. So if you ever see the movies or, or documentaries where they're talking about the Nazis, uh, and Hitler comes driving by or walking by, or um, and they refer to him as Der Führer, he is the leader. So he was a big fan of uh, Mussolini. So we've got Mussolini over in Italy, we've got Hitler in Germany, we've got Stalin in the Soviet Union. And over in Spain, it's not as big a deal, um, but uh, it is worth talking about. We have a fascist revolution led by a guy named Francisco Franco. Uh, Franco was um, a guy who was supported and armed by Mussolini and Hitler. And uh, when, when this fascist revolution gets going, he actually invites them to send soldiers over. Uh, Mussolini and Hitler send soldiers over to Spain to fight with him, almost like a scrimmage like a practice, uh, because they all saw World War II happening, uh, and this gave them a chance to practice, you know, with their weapons and, and uh, military tactics and all that stuff. So there is uh, Francisco Franco. So we have Francisco Franco in Spain. We've got Adolf Hitler in Germany. We've got Benito Mussolini in Italy, uh, and we've got Stalin over in France. Now, if you are over in Europe, and oh, there's some of the, uh, the revolutionaries that were followers of uh, Francisco Franco. And uh, this this is a famous painting by Van Gogh um, called Guernica, named after uh, one of the towns uh, in Spain. Um, and uh, it is uh, a great example in the art community of uh, drugs, of what are somebody on drugs. <laughs> I don't I mean, how do you paint that if you're not on drugs, right? Um, it's abstract art and, and it's supposed to show you the violence of, of what was happening over in, in this, uh, revolution in Spain. And, and there's like a minotaur, there's, I don't know, the eyes are crooked. There's like a, a light bulb that looks like an eyeball. I don't know what's happening here. They look like they're in a lot of pain and I'm glad I wasn't there. Also <laughs> potentially drugs. So if you're looking at this list of nations, Italy, Germany, Spain, and you know anything about the map of Europe, there's a nation that should be really like panicking right now because they're kind of surrounded by fascists. Um, Spanish fascist, Francisco Franco, German fascist. N Nazis are fascists with a little German twist. Like they're, 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 uh, they're worse than regular fascists. And then you have fascists in Italy as well. Now, here in the United States, FDR has promised to remain unentangled and free. We are going to stay isolated. We saw the mess that World War I was. Uh, we're trying to fight out of a Great Depression, and we are not going to get involved. Now, another guy over in Europe um, who sees all this stuff that's happening is getting a little bit nervous. That is the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain. So he and a bunch of other European leaders are, are, are a little bit afraid of what's going on here, and... And so, um, but they're at the same time, they, they don't want to go back through a world war. They, they all really remember world war one, the reminders of world war one was like 20 years ago. And, and they're, and they don't want to see it again. The reminders of it are everywhere. The trenches are still in France and, and, uh, the, you know, people lost so many loved ones. So Neville Chamberlain, uh, hosted an event where, um, a bunch of European leaders, including Adolf Hitler got together and basically they're going to appease Adolf Hitler. Okay. To appease him. There's a Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler there. So to appease somebody basically means to, to, to give in, uh, because if you don't, the potential problem gets worse. Um, you know, they see if, if Hitler wants certain things around Europe, he wants to take over certain places, certain countries that, used to be German. Um, and so he basically convinces them. He's like, I just want these couple things. And then, um, and then, you know, we're done. That's all we want to do. Um, everybody sees them prepare, potentially preparing for war or preparing to take land back that they lost, you know, after World War One, And uh, so they all kind of decided, okay, well, 
we'll let them have these things back because in the end, it's not worth another world war. So again, here, just to give you an idea. Uh, so here's, here's Germany right here. Okay. And, uh, here's France. We, we, this, we said France has got to be a little bit nervous right now because they're, they're surrounded by the Nazis. They have the fascists in Italy over here and we have the fascists in Spain over here. And then uh, over here with this Britain, this is uh, where England is. Um, and Neville Chamberlain, this is where they're getting a little bit concerned about, about Germany because Germany has their eye on um, some things. Okay, Germany wants to get um, this area here back. So Germany, first thing he does is he, he, he mar Hitler marches his army into the Rhineland. Okay, and when he does this, the people here used to be German. They used to be part of Germany. So they speak German. They grew up German and they would rather be German than this own little country of Rhineland. So when they marched in, the French and the British and everybody else, including the Americans, basically said, oh, you know, they said, let them have it. It's not worth the war. So Hitler saw that and was like, oh, all right, they're going to let me have it. So then he decided, I'm going to take Austria. Now, the reason he wants Austria is because Austria has always been like Germany's little brother, like a little Germany wannabe. Um, but at the same time, Hitler is actually from Austria. He's actually Austrian. He's not German. But uh, he did fight with Germany during uh, the, in the trenches during World War One, And so he, uh, he wants to get Austria back because that's his own homeland. Um, and then he says he just wants this part of Czechoslovakia here. Uh, this again, this used to be German and it's called the Sudetenland. And we're going to, I'm just going to take that part and then I'm good. I'm good. That's all I want. But the concern is this area right here. Okay. This is, if you remember from the end of world war one over here, this is Poland and Poland was given this piece of Germany right here. that used to be Germany. It's called the Polish Corridor right here. So this gave Poland access to water so that it could trade. Uh, so everybody's a little bit concerned that if, if, uh, if he keeps moving, then this is what he's going to go after next. And that's exactly what he does. He ends up taking uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, and next thing you know, he starts uh, getting ready to move on to Poland. 